All right, so it will be a little bit of a change of gear from what we've heard uh, this morning. So I'll be presenting a case study. Um, and it can be a bit of a challenge in the water industry to build um, conceptual models because we typically very data poor. So the example I'm going to be talking about is a bit different because um, this is located in Bosselton where there is historic oil and gas exploration. Uh, the Department of Water has undertaken a number of uh, geophysical um, campaigns, so um, more recently some airborne EM data, and we've collated all that data in, in a model. So Sean, in the introduction this morning, mentioned that the, the most significant risk of our era will be um, the changing climate. He also mentioned that more and more um, LeapFrog users um, will use the software for a uh, diverse range of applications. So this talk fits right in that box. So specifically when it comes to water supply in a changing climate, I'm sure you all remember the example of uh, Cape Town nearly running out of water. In, in WA, we have a number of water supply authorities that rely on groundwater for the majority of um, the water, and that planning for the long-term sustainability of those water supplies require long-term planning. So I'll present a case study of uh, Bosselton, where we've undertaken this work. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people who have contributed to this story, so the, the client, um, Bosselton Water, but also Department of Water, Department of Mine, which have provided um, uh, most of the data sets. So you've got the agenda on the screen. So I'll start with the context. Um, then we'll move to the conceptual hydrogeological model we've built with LeapFrog Works. And then we've exported this model to um, a fee flow numerical grid for flow modeling. So this slide shows um, the key um, uh, types of aquifers that you'll encounter in WA. Um, and most importantly for this study, we're looking at confined aquifers. Um, so um, the, the lowermost confined aquifer in this study is analogous to the type of resource that Bosselton Water is extracting water from. Uh, those aquifers are recharged by downward leakage and rainfall. They're under pressure, and they will flow <coughs> offshore and discharge or offshore of a um, submarine groundwater discharge. Over the, over the discharge, you have a saltwater wedge where um, seawater mix with uh, a fresh groundwater. The position of that wedge is highly dependent on the amount of flow through the system, um, which in turn depend on uh, rainfall and the amount of abstraction. So if we look more specifically at the Bosselton area, uh, you can see on this topographic um, um, image that you have the Swan Coastal Plain of fairly low elevation, and then the, the Blackwood Plateau uh, where some of those um, confined aquifers outcrop. So that's where they're recharged. The water moves in the aquifers um, uh, to the northwest, uh, roughly parallel to a major fault system where discharge offshore. The fault system separates um, the Bunbury Trough in the east, which contains those, those key aquifers that are targeted for the water supply of Bosselton, but also Bunbury, from the vast shelf in the west, which uh, does not contain those aquifers. And they've essentially been um, um, displaced and eroded. So. Um, Uh, now, looking at the stratigraphy in the region, so the key aquifer that uh, we're targeting is the Yaragli Formation. There is another confined aquifer uh, overlying it, which is the Leaderville Formation. To, um, to put things in perspective, I've got the, the volumes of water which are abstracted from those two aquifers. Um, so I don't know if you caught that, but in the previous slide, 
had the indicative flow through the system, which people have estimated between 2,000 and 3,000 uh, um, cubic meters per day per kilometer of coastline. So you can see that the current abstraction for the water supply and also for a number of agricultural applications um, um, are already quite large. So when it comes to the position of that wedge, um, the knowledge is limited to um, some recent investigations run by the Department of Water, which um, I've, I've uh, brought one, one uh, slot section here. So this is a airborne EM uh, cross section where the, the red color indicates um, uh, seawater quality, the blue um, indicates fresh water, and obviously the colors in between in onshore are more representative of clay within the formation. But essentially, you can see uh, the saltwater wedge within the Leaderville aquifer offshore. So there is um, some uh, groundwater discharge within the aquifer offshore. The, the deeper confined aquifer discharge into the Leaderville aquifer um, at, at um, possibly um, a further distance from the coast. So the, the groundwater has been uh, a resource in the area for a long time. So I was looking when preparing this talk for a um, historic photo of the bores. I couldn't find one, but I found a historic photo of the Sussex Road board members, um, which contributed to constructing those bores. So here you go. Um, <coughs> In, interestingly, going through the, going through the, the history, um, we can see that some of the earlier bores on the town foreshore had to be abandoned because of high soil content. Now, coming back to the changing climate, which I uh, talked about in the introduction. So, for um, an organization like Bustleton Water, this is already something they have to take into account um, in, into um, planning um, the, the, their operation into the future. So you have the rainfall year on year, which is being plotted here, and, and there is a clear decline of that rainfall um, and starting in 1980 up to now. And at the same time, Bosselton is um, now the fastest growing region in WA. So there is also increasing demand for water supply in the region. So with those two diverging trends, um, as a result, you see the heads within the aquifer declining. Um, and the heads um, used to be about 10 meters above sea level. They're now below sea level for most of the year. So this drives a mechanism whereby the saltwater wedge can move inland, um, ultimately uh, potentially affecting the sustainability of the bore field, which is locating uh, right at the coast. So the previous numerical modeling um, that was undertaken um, in 2001 clearly needed to be reviewed, um, and also it needed to be refined to incorporate the saltwater wedge. So we selected Leapfrog Works to do this, this, um, this, this work. Um, the idea being to be able to collate a whole range of different data set because uh, the Department of Water, for example, had a new EM data set. The Department of Mine had recently reprocessed some of the seismic data in the area. And Bosselton Water itself had um, a borehole <coughs> data sets which were not necessarily uh, available to the greater public. So uh, we've brought all those data sets into Leapfrog, so, all right. So I'll just introduce the data that we've used. Um, so you've got the topography here. Uh, all right, so you've got the topography showing the, the offshore section of the model, this one coastal plain with its low elevation, and the Blackwood Plateau, um, or at least the start of the Blackwood Plateau. So when I said we were data poor, you can see that um, th this is the boreholes we had to play with. Um, they're not ideally spaced as you, um, as you could have in a mining application. And 
the depth of investigation greatly varies. So you have some um, very deep boreholes, so essentially uh, petroleum exploration wells. There, there is a number of deep stratigraphic in, uh, exploration holes, which the geosurvey drilled in the 80s. And close to our bore field, we actually have lots of uh, water bores. Um, so uh, the density of data varies. In addition to that, we brought in um, the, the reinterpreted uh, reprocessed seismic lines, um, which, uh, which the Department of Mine um, shared. Um, and, and those ones allow us to identify three key horizons. So um, the first one is the seismic unconformity. So I talked about the Lederville formation. The Lederville formation is the Cretaceous age. And um, it, um, it overlays um, all the formation of an unconformity. Um, and those formations are either the Yaragli formation within the Bunbury Trough, or to the west, um, uh, all the sediments, uh, Permian sediments. So that's that. Um, another set of data was the EM survey um, lines. So I'll Bring them in. So again, those those various <coughs> survey lines allow us to identify the areas where we have um, fresh submarine ground or the di discharge offshore. But also, they were used to um, to delineate the members of the Lederville Formation, which contain high clay content. So you can see here, for example. Um, you have a, a, an interface between a clay-rich uh, formation at the top and um, a, a essentially sandy formation below. And those, um, those were also processed um, uh, to create a slice um, at, a, at a given depth. Um, so for example, this is a slice at 100 meters below sea level, and we can see that um, you have a, a clear a groundwater, fresh groundwater discharge area, but also areas where uh, um, saltwater intrusion is already occurring onshore um, or about to occur. So all those various data sets were incorporated into, into the conceptual model. I'll just show you one last one, which is not one we would normally think about when we, when we talk about geology is the sea temperature. So there is a study um, that the CSRO um, conducted, uh, which looked at sea temperatures. Um, and they identified that there is uh, a, a sea temperature change. And that seems to correlate uh, quite well with um, the area of a submarine ground or discharge. So this, um, this again, is confirming the extent of the um, offshore submarine ground discharge. So now quickly I'll introduce the, the various formation members um, um, once, once, once the model was built. So we have um, superficial sediments um, that are present over the Swan Coastal Plain and also offshore. Below that we've got the um, Lederville formation. And and the base of the Lederville formation is an unconformity. So it, it erodes all the sediments. And looking to the east, we have in blue uh, the Yaragli formation, which is the key target for the water supply, but also two other uh, formations um, of slightly older age. In the first um, fold block, we have the Iniaba formation, which is also of Jurassic age. Um, but less conducive to groundwater flow. And moving further to the west, we have in red the um, uh, sucor measures of Permian age, which has no permeability and um, is not conducive to groundwater exploration. Um, in brown, here is like a basaltic lava flow. So now that I've introduced those um, various formations, I'd like to talk about one of the key outcomes from the model, which was to refine the position of uh, the various um, faults. 
um, the, the key fold structure which separates the, the Bunbury trough from the vast shelf is the Bosselton fold here. So this is the historical um, uh, trace of the fault. But once all the data set were brought in, so that's the reinterpreted seismic lines, all the boreholes with palynology, but also one, um, one EM transect that Bosselton Water undertook back in uh, the year 2000, but never, was never made fully public. So incorporating all of that data, we were able to revisit the location of those faults, and we end up with um, essentially quite, quite a, a large change around um, a new borehole, which is uh, Chapman Hill. And this, um, this indicates that there is more Yaragi formation available for through flow, which is a big uh, impact on, on, on the, the future sustainability of the supply. The, the overall objective of this study is to be able to model the groundwater flow in those various formations. So the next step that was required was to subdivide those formations into hydrogeological units. Um, members that have um, uh, different hydraulic conductivities or permeabilities. So you can see that in this, um, in this model, each unit has been subdivided into different members. And for the key formation of interest, we've got four different members. And we can, um, we can recognize the, an anticline structure here and our overall um, formation becoming shallower with depths. And if we take a section through the area of interest where we've got the bore field, um, we can see that we go from the Leaderville formation overlying um, Permian basement into a small fall block, which is a Bustleton Weiring fall block, where um, the Leaderville formation is overlain by the Iniaba formation. That's where we uh, so that there was saltwater intrusion onshore because that any other formation doesn't have the through flow to push that saltwater offshore. Then we go into the uh, Bunbury Trough to the east where the Leaderville formation is deeper and is underlined by um, the Yaragli formation. That's, that's currently where Bustleton water gets um, its water from. And uh, what, we can, what we can then do with that is um, exported to a grid to do some flow modeling. So the extent of the model for flow modeling had to incorporate all of the available salinity data for calibration. So if I bring up, if I bring up the salinity, um, we, we, um, we decided to, to extend it slightly further on offshore um, to, in order to have boundary conditions that wouldn't affect the, the discharge of the water to the seabed. And the onshore extent was uh, designed to be sufficiently far away from the bore field so that, again, the boundary condition wouldn't affect the results at the bore field, which is um, at the coast. And then um, using uh, the tools within LeapFrog, the, the model was ex um, exported to a grid um, for uh, numerical flow modeling. And that's, um, that's work that's currently being undertaken um, uh, within fee flow. Um, and we expect this work will be completed um, in early 2020. So, what I might show again, and which is probably one of the big selling points for this approach, is that the, the, the numerical flow model is entirely consistent with the geological model. And we can, um, we can um, historically, the, 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 the conversion from the geologist's model to the hydrogeologist's model has always been a bit of a tricky issue. Um, so this, this allows for a good consistency between those models. Um, so now I, I think I've, I've got time for questions. Um,
don't be shy, guys. <laughs> right, so um, we've got one question that came through um, to our email. Um, <clears throat> so the person is asking, what were the key considerations when exporting the leapfrog model to free flow grid, and um, how do you go about um, doing this within leapfrog works? Mm. Yeah, so actually it wasn't um, completely straightforward, so that that might be something to add to the wish list. But the process was actually to build a grid within FeeFlow, and then uh, Leapfrog has got um, a functionality to import a FeeFlow grid, and then to evaluate a geological model to that FeeFlow grid. And the reason we did it that way is that the the for uh, for a model that looks at saltwater wedge movement, the vertical refinement is very important. Um, and also, um, with a finite element grid, you also need to spend a lot of effort making sure the angles of the uh, triangles in your grid um, are all as close as possible, 60 degrees. Um, so all of that was done outside of LeapFrog, um, but then the grid was imported into LeapFrog, and then the model evaluated to the grid and send back to FeeFlow. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I guess for the wish list and maybe something yeah, we could discuss, but I think that um, a numerical flow model softwares have got a range of different grid types. So some are triangles, but it's quadrilateral and et cetera, uh, unstructured. And bringing those functionality into LeapFrog would be great, I think, to have. So. Um, you said that there is uh, a lot of uh, the main problem is being data poor when it comes to these kind of bore fields and such. Um, would there be any availability for airborne gravimetric surveys to look at the uh, density differences between um, salt water and fresh water through flow? Yeah, I th for that specifically, I'm not sure. But actually, uh, some of the gravity, um, there was some magnetic data that was used um, indirectly um, in in helping the, the picking of the faults. Um, and, and also the Bunbury basil, is, um, its extent is also picked from um, some of that work. In terms of, um, in terms of the salt water, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. And I, I wonder if the density difference would be strong enough for, for it to be uh, discernible with the sort of regional gravity data that we have. But yeah, probably. There's a geophysicist in the room, maybe he can help us answer that question. Yeah. 